Uh, we've had some questions during the break, so let's discuss them now. Uh, the first one was from you. Question. What was it? Um, what if, in the meantime, well, well here is a use case. A bad person uh, compromised a person's private key. Mm -hmm. And uh, that person was compromised, does not know at the moment. And in the meantime, uh, the bad guy generated a new certificate, and we are uh, we are trying to validate it. Mm -hmm. So we are validating the fake certificate, uh, whilst the original offer does not know about the fact that his private key was compromised. Mm -hmm. And what happens next? Well, okay. The possible bad and good outcome. Well, there are not many good outcomes, but let's try to visualize what happens. Let's see this as a timeline. So this is when the attack took place. This is when the certificate was revoked, and, and so on. So there is this time slice during which nobody knew that the secret key was stolen. So whatever happened in this interval is not something we can correct. So there are several things to keep in mind. First of all, it's really important to revoke it as soon as you know about the problem. And then you have to try your best to figure out when it was compromised, so how long ago. So you could contact the others who were involved in transactions that were related to this certificate. So they could undo those things if they still can. Uh, in fact, there are certain uh, historical cases when this happened. Uh, one I can recall, I think it's DigiCert or DigiNotar. It's a CA from Holland, from the Netherlands, that was compromised, and for a while they didn't know about it. When they did learn about it, uh, all the stuff related to them was blacklisted. So from this moment on, everybody was relatively happy, or as happy as they could possibly get once they know this thing got revoked. But then they asked themselves the question, how could this happen in the first place? And there are several things you have to take into account if you are a CA to prevent such attacks from successfully compromising you. Let's return to this diagram. You have this super root CA, which issued certificates for subordinate CAs here in this chain. It is in the best practices to have this machine offline. It doesn't issue certificates five times per minute or a hundred times per hour. It happens every now and then. You have to make another subordinate CA and then maybe another one. So this is very infrequent. Given that this is a root CA, its value as a target is really, really high. If you compromise this, you can fake the identity of any other subordinate CA, which is a very bad thing. So you can prevent such attacks by keeping it entirely offline. In that case, when there is this once in a lifetime 
or once in a blue moon situation when you do have to sign something, you usually go into a small room where you have to sign a little uh, registry to say, I just got in. You get in, you do what you have to do, and then you get out. So when this certificate was signed, it wasn't sent by email, it wasn't sent over CMP. It was just written to a file. You took that file on a floppy disk and you brought it to some other computer where you deployed this subordinate CA. Another thing you can do to prevent these attacks from occurring is to secure the way the keys are stored. And that brings us to, to this point, among other approaches. So if you ever install the certificate on Windows, for example, um, there is a wizard where you have to click next, 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 next. And in one of the screens of the wizard, there is a checkbox that says, mark private key as non-exportable. What this means is that if I install this certificate, setting this option to true, it means that if I go to the certificate management panel, I highlight this certificate and I press the export button, it will only be able to export the certificate but not the associated private key. So on one hand, this gives you somewhat more protection because you cannot take this from one computer and move it to another computer. If you want to compromise it, you have to take over the machine and remotely make it do what you want it to do. Well, that's not impossible, but it's somewhat more complicated than just stealing it and then doing it elsewhere. But again, not impossible. Another thing you can do is use smart cards. Um, I, I, I have to go back to this point and add another remark. If I mark it as non-exportable, it means that if I'm using the standard tools, it will not be exported. However, if I use some uh, disk cloning tool and I just clone the whole hard drive and then I dump it onto another physical disk from this image and boot Windows from that clone, the secret key will be contained in it. Because I cloned it not using the API provided by the operating system, I cloned it at a lower level using just raw sectors read from the hard disk and then written to another hard disk. This is where you can further increase your security by relying on smart cards or tokens which are mechanisms that are designed to be a secure storage of some sort of data. So if this is a smart card, um, I may have told you about this in the past, that it has an operating system, a file system, and a processor. And some API for interacting with it. And when you generate a key pair, which was one of the very first steps when you were producing your CSR, you send a command to the card saying something like, generate a key pair. It generates the key pair. It stores the private key in its own memory, and it gives you the public key out. 
And the memory of this smart card is designed not to be readable using conventional methods, um, such as just taking it and reading it byte by byte without even understanding what it is about. You can only do that uh, by calling functions such as read data or retrieve data, and you give it a place in the file system of the smart card where the data you want are located. Every entry in the file system of a smart card has so-called ACLs, access control lists. And the access control list says this file can only be read if you've inserted a pin code. If you haven't inserted a correct pin code, there is a counter which decrements. And if it reaches zero, the card permanently blocks itself. So you cannot retrieve anything from it any longer. So in this case, if the private key was kept on a smart card, which is, it looks like a SIM card. Any SIM card is also a smart card. So if it were kept on one of those devices, then there are several implications. One, you cannot clone it. You cannot make copies because you cannot read the raw data of such a secure storage mechanism. It's only designed uh, to be interacted with via this API, which enforces certain security constraints. And I refer to the ACLs. And you can satisfy those ACLs if you give it the right pin. Another thing that prevents it from uh, leaking out data is the fact that you cannot use a brute force attack against it. If you try more than three pins in a row, it will permanently block itself. So in that case, if the people who ran this CA kept their um, private key on one of these gadgets, which is a physical thing you have on your, on your keychain all the time, like this, and you never let it go, then there is no way someone can take it from you. And you have to couple this with some additional security measures, such as um, whoever is in charge of holding the smart card that keeps the private key, they must show up at work every day at a given hour, and they have to sign a little entry book where they say, I am here. When they get out of the room where the card is located, they have to say, I locked the card in a safe, and I exited the room. Here is the signature to confirm, etc." So there are some procedures that you have to follow to ensure the physical security of this thing, which in turn contains that thing, which in turn is responsible for keeping this whole chain secure, if we're talking about this root CA. So what they did is they probably did not follow these rules. So as your question pointed out, indeed, there is a period during which people aren't yet aware of the fact that the key was compromised. We have to minimize this period. But it's even better if this period doesn't exist. The moment someone punched you and stole your smart card is the moment you call the security people and tell them to, to contact the CEA and tell them to revoke the, the certificate. So I hope that answers your question. And while we're at it, besides smart cards and tokens, there is also such a thing as an HSM which stands for Hardware Security Module, which is either a little card that you can plug into the motherboard, 
or an appliance on its own, which is a machine with an Ethernet port, uh, and you plug it into the power socket, and you can talk to it over the network, and it gives you a similar API using which you can generate key pairs. It generates one pair. It returns you the public key. And it keeps the associated private keys inside, and it never gives them to you directly. You can never touch this key. You can only say things such as, uh, using this API, there could be, or there normally is, a function called sign, which takes a hash at the input and uh, an identifier of, well, this arrow isn't correct. So an and identifier, like a reference to which secret key must be used to sign the, that hash that you just gave it. Um, so a reference to the, to the secret key, but not the secret key itself. And you can only get this reference if you authenticate. And you can authenticate by giving it the right password or following some other authentication procedure. It is also helpful to use a thing known as multi-factor authentication. Which implies the fact that you have to have several things or pieces of information to successfully authenticate. For example, in the case of the card, you have two factors. The first one is the card itself. You have to physically have it. And you usually refer to this as something you have. You also need to know the PIN, which people refer to as something you know. It's a piece of info you keep in your mind. Sometimes you can divide this piece of info among se several agents. For example, in the film Terminator 2, when they went to Cyberdyne to get uh, a chip which was extracted from a robot, did anyone see this? Or am I talking about mythological facts? Anyway, so there were, in this company, they kept a very high-tech chip extracted from a robot that, that came from the future for reverse engineering and analysis. And it was so important that they would not allow more than one person, no, they would not allow just one person to be able to, to extract it. So they had a wall. Let's imagine that this board is a wall. And here you have one lock, and here you have another one. This one has one key, and this one has another key. And you have to have two people. One of them has this key, the other one has that key, and they have to simultaneously turn them around. And because they are physically distant, one single person cannot do this. Moreover, one person only has this key, and the other person has that key. So if you want to bribe them, you have to bribe both, not just one. If you if you caught and tortured one person, it still doesn't help. You have to catch the other one and torture them too. And the same thing might apply to the pin. You can give the first couple of digits to one person and the other digits to another person. Or you can further um, complicate this scheme. You can write the pin down on a piece of paper and keep it in a safe, but the key to the safe is only in the possession of some delegated security officer, etc. cetera. Um, what other questions do you have about this? Where is it applied, for example? No, I am referring to PKI in general. Why was there a need to devise such a complex scheme with, with chains, with keys, with 
secure storage devices. Okay, so one reason is because of this. We have a third party. Well, in certain circumstances, we might need to prove to a third party that this exchange took place. And in that case, uh, the PKI gives us all the primitives necessary to accomplish that. Another uh, place where you've seen this in action are websites that are running HTTPS. Because when you do that, when you log on to such a website, uh, you see a little green padlock icon that means it's secure. Did you ever look into that thing to see what, what it is about? So what is it about? There is some CA or some sub CA or some sub 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 CA which issued a certificate not to a person but to a server. Okay, let me to a server. And in this server, in the certificate of that server, in the common name of the subject, you write down the URL of the website where this certificate will be deployed. So each time a browser connects to a website, they see that it's HTTPS, so it runs on port 443 by default. They connect to the server. The server sends them their certificate. Actually, yeah, it will be a somewhat longer story than I thought it would be, but anyway, let's go. So the server sends them its certificate. And let's say that this is the certificate of that server, so I don't have to draw this again. We take it, we verify um, the signature of this certificate, which came from this CA. If the signature matches, then we have to verify uh, that the certificate of this CA is trusted. So we do it again, again, again. If the whole chain is secure, we can say, OK, I can be certain that I'm really talking to this web server and not some other web server, um, which for some reason responds when I connect to the IP address that corresponds to the common name of johnsmith.com. Um, the server also has to have its private key, of course. Remember that I told you in the last lecture that asymmetric cryptography is expensive in terms of computation resources whereas symmetric cryptography is much cheaper in terms of such resources. So what normally happens is that when you connect to the server, you perform a handshake, which is based on, on this stuff I just mentioned, as well as asymmetric cryptography. And during that handshake, a so-called uh, session key is generated, which is then used to encrypt the remaining part of the entire conversation using a symmetric cipher. So during the handshake, the identity of the server is verified, then a session key is generated. It is generated by the client, the browser that connects to the, to the server. 
it generates that key, it encrypts it with the server's public key, and sends this cryptogram to the server. The server decrypts it with its secret key, extracts the session key, and according to the handshake, they also agreed that they will be using the following algorithms for encryption. And from that moment on, it will use this agreed symmetric cipher with this session key to encrypt the rest of the dialogue between the browser and the server. Um, so normally what also should happen is that your browser, when it retrieves the certificate, <clears throat> when it retrieves the certificate of the server, it should also uh, use the OCSP protocol to connect to the, to the CA that issued this certificate to check if this certificate is valid. So each time you go to an HTTPS website, you're not just looking up the DNS uh, record to see which IP address to go to. When you do that, you connect, you get the certificate, then you connect to the CA's uh, OCSP server, you verify the validity of this certificate, and when it has been confirmed, only then do you move on and do the rest of the dialogue. Um, there is another really important thing, which is super critical. Uh, imagine that I am the NSA, and I have the power to capture and log every IP packet that is sent through every network on a given territory. What happens when I sniff HTTPS traffic from start to end? Yes, I sniff encrypted data, which I have no idea what to do with, because when the browser generated this uh, random session key, it encrypted it with the private key of the web server, oh, with, the, with the public key of the web server, such that the web server could decrypt it with its own private key. So it's secure, but, what if at some point, five years later, we, the NSA, <clears throat> obtained some really super sophisticated equipment that would allow us to brute force uh, the cipher that was used to encrypt that handshake such that we then extract this session key? Exactly. So the, the problem is, with this approach that I just described, is that even though you cannot spy on me today, but if you keep all the logs of all the traffic, and if at some point you do manage to get your hands on my private key, then you will be able to decrypt all the previous traffic and see what happened in there, which is a bad thing. That's why there is such a thing as uh, PFS, which stands for Perfect Forward Secrecy. And I will explain shortly what this is about. Um, in the first scenario that I described, the browser used the server's public key to encrypt the session key and send it over. So that's one scenario which doesn't have this property. There is another scenario where we can make this an option. There is an algorithm 
called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's a sequence of steps, not very complicated and not very long, which you have to follow on both sides of the connection, on the client and on the server, such as uh, generate a random number here and here, uh, generate a prime number here and here, uh, raise this to, the, to that power, send the result to your peer, and do it the other way around, then perform some more mathematics and magic, and in the end of this sequence of steps, both sides will have the same number. However, when they were exchanging stuff between them, if someone had access to this part, for example, they sniffed this whole process, even if they did that, they would still not be able to come up with this number. So uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you will see the pseudocode for the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's around five or seven steps, and it's very easy to implement. Yeah? Uh, even if later on they get the secret key, they won't be able to generate these numbers? Um, you mean this secret key? Okay, I got it. So in the first scenario, we used the public key of the server to encrypt the session key. Throughout all of our sessions with this web server, and not only our sessions, but anyone else's connections to the server, they will be using the same public key to encrypt the random session key. So if you compromise this private key once, you have them all. All of those sessions are now plain text for you. But in the case of Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you will have a unique key for each connection. And even if the NSA spends a gazillion of resources to brute force one of those session keys, or let's just say just one of these exchanges, they only get access to this communication, but not all the other ones. Whereas in this case, it's sufficient to compromise this private key, and then you got access to every single conversation this server had since it used this private key. So does this address your question? Yes. So uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange is the, is the ingredient for achieving perfect forward secrecy. And you can configure your web server uh, which method it will use and which algorithms it will use uh, when establishing HTTPS connections. And it's a very good idea to enforce the use of Diffie-Hellman rather than uh, encrypting the session key with the public key of the server. Um, there is one more thing that you should know. Give me a moment. Hmm. What was I talking about? Uh -huh. Ah, so you are the person who runs this server. If the server needs to be able to extract the session key, 
when it is encrypted with its public key, it means that the private key has to be available. And if you leave it there, then if someone hacks your web server, they can look in your file system, they can find the private key, they can get it out, and then that's really bad news for you. Because you were not keeping it on a smart card, you were not keeping it in an HSM. So this is a very insecure way of, of storing the key. So what do you think uh, website administrators are doing to deal with this? First of all, they listen to the, que to the questions really carefully. Um, so let me repeat it again. If I want to use my private key, for example, let's say I'm running Apache on my web server. Each time Apache accepts a connection from a browser, it has to rely on the private key either to decrypt the symmetric key that was encrypted with, with the public key or some other things. If I am using super secure methods of storing my private key, such as ask me for a pin code every time you want to use that key, then how would this work for a web server? Do you really think that uh, the web server admin goes to the computer and types in the pin every time a browser connects to the server? There ought to be another way. What is it? Mm -hmm. Seconds or five seconds after connection when using this pin, so this would be the most primitive approach. To so the admin has to manually input it just once every five seconds, not for every connection. Every ten minutes, I don't know, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. What other thoughts do you have? Some ideals uh, science integrates that we will say. Well, it could be the HSM, but you still have to authenticate. For example, sometimes uh, you might rely on such a thing as you know that you are physically connected to this server. So if I receive the request, it has, the HSM has no um, network interface to receive commands from anybody else. So if it came from local host, then it's trusted. So perhaps we could use that method, yes. What else? What if we're, if we're not using an HSM? Well, I am waiting for your ideas. Has anyone ever managed the web server with an HTTPS feature? No one? <laughs> uh -huh. Has anyone ever managed a web server that has HTTPS support? Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, it's probably unfair to me, I mean, unfair of me to ask you that question because you have no experience to answer it. So, uh, typically the private key is kept in a file such as this one, remember? It has dash, 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 begin RSA private key followed by base64 data ending with dash, 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 <coughs> and RSA private key. And this file, when you decode the base64 payload, you try to decrypt it, I mean, and you try to interpret it, you will see that it's encrypted. It's encrypted with a password, which is a password you need to know in order to be able to extract the structure that makes the private key and use it. 
So what normally happens is you keep that file on the computer, and when you run the web server, when the machine boots, it says everything is started, type in the password for the private key to continue. And you go to the server's console, you type in the password, you press enter, it, it gets the password, it loads the file, it decrypts it, it keeps it in RAM, then it closes the file, um, it erases the memory area which your, which, in which your password was kept in order to decrypt this payload, and once the raw, pure, private key is in REM, it's there and it's running. And it's available for performing all sorts of operations. If somebody shuts the server off, if someone reboots, if it crashes and you need to start it again, it will start again, but it will ask you to type the password again. So this is a middle ground. You type it just once, but if your server uptime isn't ever going above five hours or a couple of days, then it can keep running for a very long time and people will be happy. What problems do you see with this method? Okay, so one suggestion was the hard bleed exploit. Which is indeed a big deal. Until this happened, uh, it was just, you know, everybody thought that if you keep it in RAM and never let any other process access this part of your memory where the private key is stored, then it's in a good place. What hard bleed has shown us is that there are certain situations in which a remote attacker can retrieve pieces of your RAM using simple, unsophisticated methods. And there's a probability that in some of those pieces that they are able to retrieve, you will have your private key, or at least a part of it. And if you run this attack for a long enough time, you can try to then put the pieces together and rebuild the private key, which has happened. Uh, shortly after this thing was discovered and it was made available to the public, you know, disclosed on the security mailing list, uh, one company, well, people analyzed it and experts said, well, yeah, it's true, you can leak up to 64 kilobytes of data using one uh, heartbeat request in the HTTPS protocol, but it's still not very likely that you will get the private key out this way. So a company called Cloudflare decided to actually give it a try. So they set up a web server with a, with a certificate and its corresponding private key, uh, giving you HTTPS support, they released it to the public saying, whoever is able to reconstruct our certificate and get the private key is a very talented person. So they started this challenge and shortly after this was announced, somebody was able to set up another web server with a different IP address, but with the same certificate and the same private key. So if you would reconfigure your DNS to resolve johnsmith.com, not as the original IP address, but as some other IP address where you set up this certificate and the private key that you managed to extract, the browser connecting to the website wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Moreover, because the certificate is in order, 
And that little padlock icon is green in the browser's address bar. You, you even have the positive encouragement of believing that, yes, this is a really secure connection. So, yeah, hard bleed was really bad news. It was also a way to, it was practically confirmed that it's possible to get the private key out. And that's why running an HTTPS web server isn't as simple <clears throat> as getting a certificate, uh, changing a few things in the config file, and, and then starting the web server. Uh, what are your questions so far? Do you feel comfortable with this whole concept of trust, what's in the certificate, and why these fields are used? or semi-comfortable. Well, let me tell you about other applications of this. Uh, there is another protocol called TSP. It stands for Timestamp Protocol, which is a way to guarantee that something happened at a given moment in time. Um, so what is necessary for that is to have a, a TSP server which is connected to a super exact source of time. It could be an atomic clock or it could be, um, do you know about NTP? It's, uh, it stands for Network Time Protocol. It's a protocol you can use to, to update or synchronize the time on your machine with the real time in this part of the universe and specifically on this planet. Uh, you can then adjust it to a time zone of your preference. So uh, you can have an it's time for me to make some space. So this device represents an atomic clock, hypothetically. Which is radioactive. <laughs> Which is radioactive. <laughs> A radioactive atomic clock. Now it uses some very exact, perfectly measured physical process such as um, the decay of some uh, isotope of some substance to count the number of ticks since a given moment in time. And based on that, they can say what time it is right now. So your time stamping server can be connected directly to this device. So then it also knows definitely what time it is. Or you could have an NTP server to which this thing is connected. And you can connect to this NTP server. Or you can connect to an NTP server, which is connected to an NTP server, which is physically connected to this radioactive nuclear uh, clock. And there is this hierarchy. This is called stratum 1 stratum 2, 3, etc. So stratum 1 means that I have a direct connection to, a, to an exact source of time. 
stratum 2 means I have a direct connection with someone who has a direct connection with an exact source of time, and so on. So you could have your TSP server connected to this or to one of those, and when a request comes to it, um, for example, let's say we are we're getting back to this transaction where we send we send someone 500 kilograms of cheese in exchange for 100 US dollars. It's all written in this document. We take this document, which contains all the data, we hash it, then we send this hash to the TSP server, it adds a timestamp, the current time that it knows it's, it's certain, it adds a timestamp to that hash, and then it signs it with its secret key. And it sends us back the response. So now that we have that, we have that little timestamp, which is associated with the hash, with this hash, with the time which we took from this server, which we all agreed to trust because we decided to trust this TSP server, either because it has legal power or because we explicitly added it to our list of trusted sources of time. And it has the signature of this TSP server. Based on, on this thing, now you have cryptographic proof of the fact that this, which we represent through its hash, took place at this time, which we know because it's signed with the secret key of this trusted timestamping authority. Uh, I should have written TSA, uh, timestamping authority, which runs a TSP server, but the proper term for the, the whole entity is TSA. So um, timestamping is yet another um, example of how cryptography is used on a daily basis, not only in, in business transactions, but also <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. Uh, but also when it comes to things such as when did this or that action take place. And again, I must emphasize that this is, all of this is based on several primitives. One of them is asymmetric cryptography. If I encrypt something with a private key, it can be verified with its public key and vice versa. And this propagation of trust. And the fact that hashes are irreversible, they are unique. Of course, there are collisions, but coming up with a collision is not a trivial challenge. So up to this point, uh, you've, at least in theory, learned about several things you can turn into reality by combining cryptographic primitives in different ways in order to obtain high-level features such as being able to verify the authenticity of a document, being able to prove to a third party that some transaction took place, being able to formally prove that some thing took place at a given moment in time, and so on. So all of these things are the result of the application of cryptographic primitives. In our future classes, We'll have a few other exercises where these uh, cryptographic primitives are combined uh, to achieve or to implement different functionality. So the point is that once you get comfortable with these primitives, you will learn how to apply them to specific problems, even if those problems were not previously researched by somebody else. Uh, what 
questions do you have for now? Browser when it uh, takes HTTPS request, mm -hmm. uh, it verifies with the authority if the certificate is authentic. Mm -hmm. Is the browser doing this thing or the server? The browser. So you have to keep in mind that by default the server is an untrusted party. Okay. You only trust them after you verify. And you cannot delegate the process of verification to the one whom you are verifying. You have to do this yourself. So if, hold on, if you use a, a sniffer to see what your web browser is doing, every time you go to a website, you should also notice that it issues an OCSP request or it downloads the CRL <clears throat> and it looks up the certificate in that list. If the browser isn't doing that, it's a bad browser or it's a misconfigured browser. If it doesn't do that, there is yet another possible explanation, um, which, well, now I can actually explain it because it's related to timestamps. So normally, the web server uh, I mean, normally the web browser connects to the OCSP server to verify if a given certificate is still valid. The server gives it back a response, and the browser is happy, and you see a picture of a cat on your screen. Let's visualize that graphically. So this is the server, this is the client, and this is the CA. So the server connects to the client. Well, the client sends its certificate. It checks with the CA, is it valid? It gets a response, and if it's valid, then we go on. Now, remember that uh, TCP is a heavyweight protocol. Every time you establish a connection, you have to go through the three-way handshake. You have to do a lot of things. So this process takes time. On one hand, you have to connect to this entity. On the other, to this one, it could be geographically in a different area. So it extends the time it takes to actually visualize that picture of a cat on your web page. So there is this relatively new thing that you might be interested in, which is related to your question. Every now and then, the server sends a request to the CA. OK, let me draw it here. So. This is a new page. Every now and then, the server sends a request to the CA over OCSP asking it, is my certificate valid? The CA sends back a response saying, yes, it's valid. And it also has a timestamp in it. So. You have something like this. If the current time is 12.30, the CA says, it's 12.30, uh, what day is it today? October the 6th, 2014. At 12.30, this certificate is valid. And this thing has a timestamp and the digital signature of the CA. And this response is kept on the server. And what normally happens is that when the client connects, it sends back not just the certificate, but also this thing along with the certificate. 
So now the client can get the certificate, then it can look at this thing, check this time, well, the whole timestamp, and if it's not too, too long ago, and then it can say, you know what, I'm just gonna rely on this, I'm not going to connect to the CA to verify myself. So now, uh, it is only the mission of the server to, to get a refresh of this confirmation at regular time intervals, whereas uh, the clients don't have to connect to the CA directly, they, they only interact with this entity, so there is less time wasted on TCP handshakes and stuff. You have a question. How do clients verify that the, this timestamp with uh, the validity of the certificate is from the CA and not from the server itself? Because it is signed by the timestamping authority ran by this CA. Yeah, but they still have to, to connect to the CA so that they could prove that the digital signature is from the CA, no? Yeah, but this CA is in their trusted list of CAs. So this prop, it's based on the fact that you trust this, and if you trust that, you trust everything underneath. How do they verify the CA? Either it's baked into your settings, or at some point in the past you have manually added it to this list, or... So it's not in that list, then it will go from the whole step, the whole... Yeah, but at some point it still boils down to one root CA that you have to trust. So, um, when you asked who verifies uh, if the certificate is still valid, the server or the client? Well, in the first case, it's the client, but in this new scenario, the server could do some of the work as well. So, self Self-signed self certificates are not valid. Well, they are valid unless. No, wait a second. So. They are valid, but there are questions. This certificate it is. Not be valid, so, do you trust so this warning that your browser shows to you means that this certificate you are dealing with has been issued by some CA which you do not trust. Do you want me to trust it from now on? So you have to click uh, show me the certificate. I understand the risks. I want to trust this uh, CA. You add it to your list of trusted CAs and then you will have no more questions. So actually when we click trust, we trust the server that issued that certificate or, the, or only that certificate? Well, I think we should check what the browser is saying. Um, you see, if that certificate were issued by a CA you already trust, then the question wouldn't even come up. Okay. And another question is about cookies attack. If somebody, mm -hmm. somebody sniffs all the cookies by a connection, mm -hmm. Well, um, I think the answer is it depends. First of all, what do you mean by cookie attack? What kind of a cookie attack? And what is the server doing with this cookie? Okay, uh, I will give an example of with a, uh, how to hack a Facebook page or something mm -hmm. profile. Uh, I tried it by myself with my account. I just sniffed all the traffic from the, my client is sending to Facebook and the mm -hmm. cookies. I tried to replace the cookies in a problem that I opened up my profile later uh -huh. on and stuff. Okay. 
So HTTPS can be used for several things. What you normally see on a daily basis is when the client verifies the identity of the server. And the server proves to the client that, yes, I am really Facebook.com. But there is also such a thing as mutual authentication. When the client also has a certificate, and when a connection is established, you verify them and they verify you. If you have such a scheme, then the fact that you have the cookie isn't going to help you because you also need to have the certificate and its private key. But in this other case, you have a problem. And whether you can deal with it or not, well, you can deal with it, but it depends on how your system is built. Uh, for example, you can keep an archive of IP addresses and user agents which you use to connect to Facebook.com. So it doesn't just use the cookie, but it uses the cookie in conjunction with the user agent string and the IP address. And if one of those things is different, it will ask you to re-authenticate and give the password again, for example. But user agent can still be overwritten. Uh, user agent? Yeah. The IP address can be overwritten too if you can manipulate the router, which is why these things are just some steps to make it more complicated for the attacker, but not impossible. If you want to be really super secure, then you need mutual certificate authentication. That's... Uh, huh? Or two-factor authentication with your mobile phone. Or something like that. But, for example, if you steal my phone, you can have a look at my it's, it's very numbers. It's probable that, that the, uh, the stealing of your phone will go unnoticed by you. Yeah, so, again, you can make it more complicated for the enemy, but there are certain limits. At some point, you will realize something is wrong. Is it time for a break? Yeah. Uh, what other questions do you have? We can discuss about Oh. Well, we'll do that tomorrow, because we have a class tomorrow.